For over 70 years, the question of whether there was something to the UFO phenomenon has seethed in popular culture, even turning places like Roswell and Area 51 into tourist destinations. This has helped to create an atmosphere where the topic was seen as fringe and wasn't taken seriously by most scientists, and in fact approaching the subject from a scientific standpoint was outright dangerous to both your career and funding. But sometimes even worse. Let me tell you the strange tale of one Dr. James E. MacDonald. MacDonald was an atmospheric scientist that specialized in cloud formation and dynamics wrote many academic papers on the matter and was well respected within his field for many years. Then he saw a UFO along with two other meteorologists, and none of them could explain it with known phenomena. Naturally, as a phenomenon of the atmosphere, he was immediately interested, and that led to a decades-long investigation of the phenomenon. It did not go well. Dr. MacDonald, after many years of research, concluded that it wasn't a phenomenon of nature and that the alien hypothesis was the least worst explanation. Echoing the conclusions of astronomer J. Allen Hynek and Dr. Jacques Vallée, that once you dig deep enough into the subject, there is a kernel of weirdness, hidden amongst the fluff that characterizes the UFO phenomenon. And it's so weird, even an alien explanation may fall short of explaining all the aspects of it. MacDonald was not merely ridiculed for his interest in UFOs, but was basically ruined by a prominent skeptic of the time that got his funding canceled all while he was being brought into a congressional hearing on potentially damaging aspects of a proposed supersonic transport aircraft that many scientists believed could damage the ozone layer, only to be ridiculed by a member of Congress over his unrelated UFO interest to discredit him. A congressman whose district just happened to be the location where the aircraft was going to be produced. Long story short, McDonald's credibility as a scientist suffered severely, his wife left him, and he committed suicide. So why the stigma? Why the taboo? As someone that often talks about the possibilities of alien life in the universe, I have had countless people over the years ask me, in my comments, why the scientists weren't taking a look at the issue. Well, now they are, and to much controversy, through the Galileo Project. And my guest today, as a member of that, explores just why there was a severe stigma and why it's not scientific to keep the taboo going. You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Jacob Hack Misra. Jacob Hack Misra is a senior research investigator at the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. As a member of the American Geophysical Union and the International Astronomical Union, his research focuses on understanding the conditions that allow life to survive on Earth and the possibility of detecting signatures of biology or technology on other planets. He also studies the possible futures of life in the solar system. He received his MS in Meteorology in 2007 from Penn State University. He received his PhD in Meteorology and Astrobiology in 2010. He enjoys playing music as a drummer and vibraphonist. He is a member of the psychedelic rock band Mystery Train. All right, now, <laughs> the one question that a lot of people have, and it's going to come up in the comments, is what if they are already here and that the UAP phenomenon represents a presence of um, an alien civilization in not, not just in our star system, but in our atmosphere with us, uh, which strikes me as about the most dangerous thing that can happen <laughs> to a civilization in the universe. What are your thoughts on the UAP? Do you think that there's any legs there as far as an alien origin for them? I think we don't know enough about the UAP yet to even, for me, to prefer a hypothesis. So I'll say a couple things. Um, you know, I, I think um, there's a lot of, of, you know, a lot of, you know, mud to kind of wade through in, in the UAP problem. And I think, you know, the fact that there's congressional hearings on this and, and government interest has helped to focus the problem on, you know, the specific set of, 
of things that fighter pilots and commercial pilots see in the sky. Because, you know, sometimes when you talk about UFOs with people, uh, it gets into things about alien abductions and out of body experiences and things that, that you know, you can, you can talk about those things, but I think that is separate from what the congressional hearings coming up are going to be about. And that already, just to disentangle that, th th those two things, um, I, I think is is hopefully happening now, but but that's sort of a problem, especially for scientists who have sort of a visceral visceral reaction to studying UFOs or UAP. Um, and it's because you know, there's there's too much association with too many topics that that even if they're all interesting in their own right, they 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 may not all have a connection with these aerial objects that have been sighted and are not identified. Um, so what are those things? Again, I don't know, but I think we really need more data on them. The, the previous, you know, data collected by, by, you know, Project Blue Book in the past uh, was incomplete to accurately be able to identify what the unidentified objects were. Um, whatever is known about, you know, the recent, you know, Pentagon, Navy uh, 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 sightings, um, we don't have the full data. We can't really say, it. and that's because they don't want to release classified information about their instruments, which is maybe a good thing. Um, but but we don't have enough data to go on. So you know, to me, um, I do acknowledge the possibility, and, and this is where I, I maybe differ with some of my science colleagues. Like I, I get what people are saying when they 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 think this might be alien, because if I if we talk about where the astrobiology SETI community has, has has thought about techno signatures. We've been spending, you know, we, we we spent some time talking about techno signatures for extrasolar planets, other planets around another star system. But you could also have a techno signature within the solar system. You could have a, a probe, an alien probe floating around the solar system. And so here's just sort of the the, the hole in SETI in, in for for many scientists is if there's a spacecraft coming from an alien civilization and is floating through the solar system it's at pluto's orbit say like well that might be interesting you know if, if we observe that that would be um you know like avi Loeb thought you know muamua was an alien spacecraft I, I don't agree with him on that but i think the possibility is real and so that would be like this so maybe there's a spacecraft it's at a distance it's coming through the solar system the possibility of that, all SETI scientists would agree. There's, you, that's that's not a, that hypothesis is fully valid within what what we study. There, there could be a spacecraft at the distance of Pluto or Neptune. So suppose that spacecraft comes and lands on Mars or the Moon. Well, th that's that's been considered by SETI scientists too. And there's papers about you know looking at high resolution images of the Moon or Mars for anomalies that might be technology because maybe a spacecraft landed there or crashed there that wasn't one of ours, something like that. So that's all fair game. But if that same spacecraft enters Earth's atmosphere and it's spotted and it looks like a flash of light, it's called a UAP. And for historical weird reasons, it's now off limits for, for SETI scientists and, and astrobiologists because it's in this weird UAP category that has, you know, a lot of baggage associated with it. But, you know, hypothetically, there's no reason that the same spacecraft that was out of Pluto's orbit and on the moon couldn't enter the atmosphere. And so we, I would be interested in all three of those cases as an astrobiologist who wants to find extraterrestrial life. So I am not yet convinced that anything that has been released yet, there's not enough data for me to, to say that we're looking at that. I can't say that we're not looking at that either. I say we don't have enough data to see, but I acknowledge that's that's what people have in mind. And you know, you have to spell this out sometimes for SETI scientists, and it makes you a little bit uncomfortable. But but that that is the connection. We just don't know if that's what we're seeing now. But you have to keep in mind that it could be, uh, even if nothing we've seen like that now is, that still could happen in the future. And so we should keep that in mind. Now, through the Galileo Project, we now have scientists looking into the phenomenon again, completely independent of the government, which is important because they can't really tell us, if, for the reasons you state, they can't tell us the capabilities of their sensors. Right. <laughs> because they're also, tell they're also telling their rivals. Um, so we look into it independently. Now, this has happened before. There have been legitimate credentialed scientists that looked into the UFO phenomenon, as it was, as it was known then, um, and came to some interesting conclusions. And I want to go through each of those because there's some interesting things. The first was Harvard. 
And this was the the, the first chair of uh, Harvard, Donald Menzel. And matter of fact, that chair is now called the Donald Menzel. Um, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. Anyway, Menzel looked into it and saw a UFO himself and with a number of scientists and determined what it was, which it was Venus and, you know, atmosphere got weird. And he believed that all UAP phenomenon were explainable by phenomena of the atmosphere. Now I have to preface this. I've been an amateur astronomer for about 35 years, looking at the night sky often. And very rarely have I seen anything that I couldn't explain, but there was one where I did. I saw a red light in the sky that was above the cloud ceiling, which was 30,000 feet, and I observed it doing all kinds of things. It wasn't a drone, anything like that. But the thing that struck me about it is I was like, that is not how I would expect an alien spacecraft to behave. And I started wondering about things like plasma. And this is, you know, this is something that, that he wondered about that maybe there is something about the atmosphere that happens rarely that we don't understand. And do you think phenomenon of plasma is, you know, a very real thing and that, that we, it's something we need to study about our own atmosphere as, as a, you know, your background is in meteorology. I mean, is this something that, that (laughs) maybe people really are seeing something, but it's not what they think. It's not an alien. It's, a weird plasma thing that we don't know about the atmosphere. There are almost certainly, yes, things about the atmosphere we don't understand. Um, you know, everything from just weird optics uh, that, that occur just given the time of day and the clouds and, and, and the other factors um, to, to other things that could have to do with, you know, what uh, what, what gaseous species are present at a certain amount of time and, and you know, what, what, what are the conditions of, of the wind and, every, you know, th- there's a lot of things that, that could be sort of transient phenomenon in, in specific locations in the atmosphere that we don't understand. Um, with UAP, there's, when you say an object is a UAP, I think maybe there, there's, there's a little bit of a confusion, not for you, but maybe, you know, when we talk to other people who are like very excited to find aliens and, and think UFOs are aliens, when you say UAP or UFO, for some people, there's an association that you mean alien. You mean you know, a flying saucer. And, and when, when a UAP is, according to, you know, the government task force that studies this, it's just a thing in the atmosphere that you haven't identified yet. And so... I think it's quite probable that, you know, of the hundred some cases that the recent task force couldn't explain, um, some probably are, an, you know, atmospheric phenomenon. I think the danger that like, you know, some skeptics that I, that I talked to who have sort of the, the same type of view that Menzel had, that all UAP are explainable. It's possible that they're all explainable. That's, that's a totally valid position and a hypothesis that's sort of the null hypothesis in fact for an experiment like the galileo project that's the null that that they're all explainable and you have to demonstrate that some are not explainable but the caveat is probably it's, it's very unlikely that all of the unexplainables are explained by the same thing so you might have some of them explained by some atmos- you know, novel atmospheric phenomena maybe you find two novel atmospheric phenomena and a weird bird uh, there, there's there's probably a bunch of stuff going on in that unknown that needs to be unpacked. Unidentified, you know, right. it's 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 a very strong word, and I think sometimes people forget it. Now to the next scientist, um, an atmospheric scientist studied clouds, James McDonald, and his conclusion was that aliens were the least worst hypothesis, and that the phenomenon very well could have been of alien origin. Now, this is terrifying because whenever you have a more advanced civilization in contact with a less advanced one, it never goes well. And we we would be in a situation where the solution to the Fermi paradox is the zoo hypothesis, regardless of the intent of the alien civilization. Now, does that keep you up at night if, if, if the UAP end up being something, you know, say we only need one, you know, say one of them <laughs> appears to be due to the activities in alien civilization. Uh, it doesn't keep me up at night, <laughs> but uh, I mean, you know, James we- uh, James uh, James McDonald um, was one of the main drivers that got me interested in this as a science problem. 
I think James McDonald still, uh, up until very recently, is one of the only scientists who or, who, who like really took this seriously in, in a thorough way and dedicated a lot of the latter half of his career to it. Uh, at the expense of his reputation to many of his colleagues, uh, you know, he was a National Academies of, of Sciences fellow. Um, but but even then, you know, I think a lot of people thought he was on a wild goose chase. Um, he, he did seem to come, you know, reading his, his work, he seems a lot stronger on the extraterrestrial hypothesis uh, than I'm at. But, I, you know, his methods are, are good. His method, his approach is very convincing. And it, it's the architecture that you need to have for a scientific investigation. I mean, I think, you know, he was just limited by how much data was available. He could look at Project Blue Book. I think he, you know, interviewed uh, witnesses, which there's a lot of, of problems, not that all witness uh, testimony is, is not credible, but there's, there's, there's a lot that we've learned since James McDonald's time, you know, by social scientists about how to conduct interviews in a way that, that sort of maintains the authenticity and, and doesn't sort of lead the interviewer and such. And so, um, you know, for better or for worse, that's what we have. But so, you know, am I worried about contact with aliens? I mean, I guess not, because if they're here, they're here, and that's what reality is, and we ha they haven't destroyed us yet. So um, I, I, don't, I, I guess I, I have to wait and see that there's data to convince me that I should worry before I'm going to worry. Now, McDonald's, uh, it, it, it was kind of tragic. I mean, he committed suicide, yeah. and you know, his funding was yanked. A lot of bad things happened, and they happened because of the stigma that was developing. And we're dropping this stigma right now. You know, we're just openly talking about it. But do you fear that that stigma could come back and really damage some people's careers if they even look into this? I don't think so anymore. I think the fact that the U.S. government is taking this seriously now and, you know, you have a handful of scientists who are, are speaking about this like we are now, um, I think that's had a, a very positive impact on the ability to, to take this seriously as an interdisciplinary science. I mean, even NASA has, you know, a, a, in one of their FAQ pages, uh, you know, they, they talk about UAP and they, they say, like, you know, we don't know what these are and science is interesting and we should study things that are interesting and we don't know what they are. And so, you know, they're not saying they're alien, but they're not saying don't study this. They, they, they're saying we, we should we should study things because we don't know what they are. And so the fact that that, uh, you know, I, th I think that is, is a sign of, of a changing culture, at least, you know, within within science, it's maybe more more tolerated. You're not maybe going to get tenure right just yet based on your UAP uh, study. But I don't think you're going to get denied funding anymore. I, th I think we're, we're at least yeah, I think in this country we're past that point. Safe to say. And we come to the the elephant in the room as far as scientists in the UFO community, Dr. J. Allen Hynek and also Dr. Jacques Vallée, which they have both, uh, they came to a different conclusion that the phenomenon was too broad. In other words, none of the above, not alien, not human, and something else that we don't understand or know anything about. Do you think that one has legs? I mean, it's unknown. So, you know, if it's an unknown phenomenon, uh, unidentified. I don't see enough data to make any judgment about it myself. Um, so I can't say what it is. I, I can't say, I mean, so, so um, you know, I've seen some of Jacques Vallée's papers where, you know, you, you, you maybe some of them get a little bit speculative, but, um, you know, this is just why I don't entertain hypotheses because I just think the data is incomplete and I don't want to get drawn to one specific set of data and get got too caught up in a specific type of hypothesis. Uh, but if we don't know, I can't exclude any hypothesis. So I, I really can't say until we have more data. Now, collecting that data and the Galileo project, which I know you're on, um, as a scientist, what data are you looking to collect? What sensors are could you deploy to try to gain insight on the nature of the UAP? Well, it's a transient phenomenon. So what you want to do is, you know, ideally you want a network of sensors, not just one spread over an area. Ideally, this would be a global network, but that's really expensive. So you do the best you can. And, and for Galileo Project, it's going to depend on funding. Um, right now, it's just you know building a prototype. 
But um, I mean, just in general, there's other groups that have, have looked at this too. Um, you, you, you want a few things. And the main thing that you want to be able to do is observe objects in the sky. And then you want to be able to answer like, is this something that I, I can identify or not? So first you need a set of instruments that could identify known objects. So you want, you know, a, a high speed, high resolution camera so that you can take video and, and you know, analyze you know, objects coming across your field of view, you know, like an all sky, you know, kind of, kind of field of view lens. Um, you, you want to be able, you'd want to take uh, images, not just in the visible, but in the infrared. Um, the infrared is going to give you, you know, temperature and just additional, you know, data about, about the, the structure of the object. Maybe, maybe, um, you know, radar would help you figure out, um, the speed of the object. Um, you know, you, you would essentially what you, what you're doing, you'd probably, so, so for, so just those right there, you know, you could, you could use those, a set of instruments like that and determine if an object is, is an airplane and, and then maybe identified or a bird or something like that. Um, so then you can also look at, you know, some of these previous UAP observations, uh, like, well, there was, you know, radio signals associated with them. Maybe some of them had some, you know, uh, uh some uh, you know particle signature that, that was associated with it. So so you can add instrumentation like that, you know, a, 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 you know, radio receiver or other things like that to um, that might be motivated by n not just the known signals, but some of the unknowns that that you know maybe you know you you were were going to you know you're motivated by, you know, we don't know what we're going to find. This is where it's difficult. How do you know what you're going to find when it's unknown? But if you have, you know, you know that the the Pentagon found this on radar. Okay, so well, radar is going to help pick up these unknowns. Um, there might be sound associated with them. So maybe you want to record the sound. So, you know, you're really just kind of building an array of sensors across the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, maybe including, you know, some other elements like sound. Uh, to try to capture, you know, data about your environment, about things flying across the sky, um, and then do that for a long time and see if you find anything that you can't explain. And if you get that far, well, then at least you have data of something that's unexplained and it's robust data so you can sit and study it. And probably you'll explain it, you know, just like the SETI people do with when they find radio interference, you know, the first ones will probably be explainable and you'll just learn something about your system. But then eventually, if there's really something out there that we don't know, and it doesn't match anything we understand, then you're going to pick it up if it comes across, you know, your your array of network uh, of, of, of sensors. Uh, and, and then we're collecting data like scientists, and we can try to see like, what is the signature of a truly unidentified object? Now, let, let me ask you this um, before we get into a different area of this subject. Now, my favorite explanation for what I saw being plasma is based on the fact that this thing just was erratic and irrational in its behavior. It looked like, you know, maybe ball lightning or something like that. Do you anticipate that this data set that's being taken by the Galileo project is going to be useful in atmospheric science? Meaning if you see ball lightning on this thing or, you know, plasmas and things like that, I mean, is that a paper in and of itself that you might discover something natural in the atmosphere with this this data set that, you know, could make it doubly useful, basically? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If, if you're looking for anomalies in the atmosphere, I mean, you know, uh, sure, finding aliens would be really exciting. I'm not going to lie. Uh, but yeah, if we find ball lightning or you find, you know, some new, new way that birds migrate or whatever else it is, um, you know, that might not be the, the reason that the, the search was conducted. That might not be the reason, you know, some investors gave money. They might be motivated by a different thing. But you discovered something. You did science. And, and more importantly, or as importantly, um, you've reduced the, the number of objects that are now classified as UAP. They're, they're known now. They're just APs, right? They're aerial phenomena. So, so that's sort of the goal. You know, Avi Loeb, I, I know, has said this um, before that, you know, wh whether, whatever you find, the goal of, you know, not just Galileo Project, any project that's going to look for UAPs, the goal is to make that term obsolete. You should identify everything and we just know what's in the skies. 
and, and if, if some of the things were aliens, well, then great, that's amazing. If they were all just you know atmospheric phenomena and clouds and birds and airplanes, well, then at least we know how to classify those things better because apparently we're not good at that right now. Now, say it turns out that we do have evidence for something. Now, one thing that, that's sort of in the shadows here about this subject is the idea of recovered materials. I know Gary Nolan has something that's isotopically really weird and, you know, just doesn't quite fit with anything we would do, you know, um, just isotopes that just don't look like the solar system. Do you think that that's an area of uh, study that's really worthwhile checking into because maybe the evidence is, is already here and that we might have stuff in our possession that we have just no explanation for other than a piece of alien manufactured metal. I mean, you know, that would be amazing. I have not, you know, as far as I know, none of this data has been made public, so I haven't seen it. Um, but like I was saying, just if we talk about the hypothetical, that hypothetical spacecraft that was on Mars that was a monolith or whatever that you could study with a rover, but it enters the Earth's atmosphere, it's a UAP, you know, just taboo on it, or has been until recently, but that's still something you could study. So if that crashes onto Earth, uh, or, or it, it breaks up in orbit and the pieces fly to Earth, um, of course that would be interesting, and that would be tremendously interesting, and, and there would be a, a, probably a much better chance of us uh, recognizing it as alien compared to rem a remote, you know, spectroscopic technosignature, you know, CFCs in the atmosphere of a planet or something. So, um, Yes, that, that's remarkable. And, and I think that, you know, if, if a scientist is convinced that that's what they found, like, then you have to study it. I mean, I'd love to see this in, like, open peer review. And, you know, if there's government classification, that just complicates the matter. Because, But, I mean, that I, I would love to see a paper like that, a scientist who claims they found a piece of metal from an alien civilization. You do some analysis of it. You, you, you publish the paper. Other scientists can look at it. Because if, if it's really true... And the data is convincing that then it'll speak for itself. And, and uh, you know, I, I again, so I don't know if we're there, but that's certainly a valid hypothesis that, that's worth thinking about if you were to find something like that. It's probably worth a test, you know. <laughs> um, I'm sure that the vast majority of such things come across as being mundane, you know, um, misinterpreted or hoaxes or things like that. But there are a few things out there that may be testable, or at least people have claimed they are. Now, um, okay, well, I have a problem, a fundamental problem with a lot of the accounts of UFOs because, you know, people say things, but you can't be that person. And often, like Betty and Barney Hill, they've been dead for decades. You can't go in and re-question and get a new profile of the this past case. Right. Do you think that's a serious problem? I mean, basically... You know, people always say, well, the evidence, the evidence, the ev well, the evidence is anecdotal and that's not good enough, you know, for science. Right. That's why we need new so instruments. Do you think yeah, that's exactly why we need yeah. new instruments. We need a fresh look and with with good instruments. And um, uh, but do you think like, for example, in some of the, the government stuff, um, like uh, the infamous Nimitz incident, mm -hmm. um, where you had something going on, you know, and it's it's not easily explainable. But again, you can't. You know, you can't be that pilot. You can't, you know, we don't know what they saw. But do you think that that the aggregate of information and accounts that we have regarding UAP at least tell us where to put the telescopes of the Galileo project? I mean, can we derive, you know, locations um, of where to look? I think there's, there's, yeah, there's kind of wide ranging opinions on this. I know there's there's someone who joined the Galileo team whose name escapes me, who, who's done an analysis, of claims that there are preferable locations. Um, but, but I don't know how even that analysis, I don't know how strong of a case it is. Um, it, there could be, you know, there could be. I think I think more work is needed on that. And because, you know, there's there's. Uh, there could be a selection bias. You know, there's a lot that have been cited around military bases. Is that just because the military have the right equipment to see them? Or is that because whatever they are, they're drawn to military bases? Um, either of those things could be correct. Um, but I think we need better instruments that are deployed on a more wide scale 
uh, to be able to, to see that. I think the analysis I'm alluding to that I mentioned is, is all based on, you know, at least largely based on, on eyewitness reports again. And so I think what we really need is a network of sensors that give us data over a large geography. And then if we find, you know, clustering in certain areas, then we have like real data to, to convince us that that's what's going on. Now, the tragedy of the idea, the notion of an alien civilization crossing light years of space to get here and only to crash into New Mexico aside, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, uh, the idea that, um, all right, would it be a, a, a valid method of METI, you know, say they want to message us just to show up here and drop, uh, you know, an a isotopically anomalous you know, piece of metal <laughs> on a beach and say, you know, just to, because they have no other commonality to communicate with us. That's all we can do is show us something that shouldn't be here. Um, do you think that that's actually a viable way for <laughs> an alien civilization to announce its presence? It could be. To drop yeah, yeah, it could be. Why not? Send an artifact, uh, crash it into the planet. Um, yeah, could totally could be. I mean, there, there's, there, there's, we don't know the mind of an alien, but we do know that something like that would be convincing to us. It's not of this world. So, yeah, send an artifact to, you know, I mean, you, Marco Polo probably did things like that to prove that he went to China. You bring back artifacts that you couldn't make locally. And you know, so uh, th there's, there's no reason why not, right? Now, one lands on the White House lawn and <laughs> steps out and wants to talk to the president. How, what are the chances of successful communication being established with an alien civilization in any context? Do you anticipate that if we detect something, whether far or near, we'll even be able to talk to it? That really depends on a lot. And so, yeah, the chances, I, I probably couldn't say anything about the chances. Um, you know, I can... So... Some scientists talk about the idea of a mathematical language. Could you define a common frame of reference to exchange ideas just based on the fact that the two different civilizations will understand physics? And so this is sort of a, uh, it comes out of the radio SETI uh, uh, tradition because you, you don't know anything about your receiver, or your listener, you know, you, you, all you know is that there's a radio receiver and a radio uh, transmitter on each end. And so you know that each each side understands that technology. So if you understand how to build a radio transmitter or a radio receiver, you have to understand certain things about physics. And, you know, so some people have defined these like self-defining languages where you start by defining mathematics, like zero equals zero and zero plus one equals one. And then you define the periodic table of elements and you can kind of work up this mathematical language. Um, you know, you can't really say, hello, we come in peace very easily in that, but you could say, um, we are on planet Earth, here's where it is, uh, this is the composition of our atmosphere, you, you could exchange ideas about math and physics and technology, and here's how to build a better, you know, polymer and, you know, things like that. So, so you could, you could imagine that. Now, Alien lands on the White House lawn. I mean, maybe they're trying the same thing. Maybe they're trying their mathematical language. You know, maybe you know, maybe they've been studying us a lot, and they they have a, a, a translator to speak English. I mean, you know, the it, it it's it's already kind of in in the sci-fi realm, and and um, I don't think there's anything here that's that we're really being limited by the laws of, of physics on. You know, if, if you're there, that's sort of how do two species communicate? I mean, maybe it'll be the way that we communicate with her pets and you know the alien will just like pat the president on the head and you know you'll understand that it's peace so it, 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 there, there's a million ways that could go <laughs> now the this is an area that is not yet well explored within either astrobiology or the ufo community and it is based on two papers that i know of one by uh jason wright another by adam frank that posit the idea that we can't rule out that this planet once spawned a prior technological civilization, also known as the Silurian hypothesis, right. where we can't rule it out because Earth is constantly renewing its surface and subducting and doing all these things and destroying evidence. And it's hard enough to find evidence of abiogenesis, you know, because there, there are just very few rocks left from that period because they've all been destroyed. So we're left with a question. If this planet 
With this hanging over us, this planet could have produced a prior technological civilization that went to space and is now coming back to visit and check on the home world. Does that mean that close aliens are forever impossible to prove? Because you could, you can look at genetics. Say you got a crashed saucer and a, and a frozen body. You look at its genetics and you're like, well, it could have disguised its genetics. It's highly advanced. It, it could be, you know, its genome could be from Earth for all we know, even though it doesn't look like it. Or we look at the isotopes and like, well, they could have manufactured it that way. And we just have no way, even with something so profound as a frozen body and a down saucer, we still just have no way of proving that it's actually of true alien origin or if it's a cousin from here. Oh, well, you know, so so that uh, it gets into like like when we say the word prove, um, there's it, it just makes me think of, uh, of like, you know, the scientific method you learn in grade school where, you know, you, you kind of get to the end of this process and, and you've, you've kind of shown your hypothesis to be true. And, and I think that's, you know, one of the places that uh, this UAP discussion can, can get, you know, caught up in, in circles sometimes, when, especially when scientists and, you know, others who are like really wanting to find aliens, uh, you know, get, get in discussions. Um, and I think, you know, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, but I think it's good in the end. In science, you don't ever really prove anything. Um, as weird as that may be sound sometimes, uh, there's, there's never really, there, there's evidence for sure, but in terms of like proving a hypothesis to be true, um, you, you really don't ever get that. But what you do get is a hypothesis that has so much overwhelming evidence in support of it that all the alternatives seem really untenable, at least to most scientists. Um, but, you know, there might always be a couple scientists that are skeptical, and that's part of how science works. Um, the, the Viking lander had a, a life detection experiment on it in the 70s. And you know, it scooped up some soil, and the soil went into a chamber. It performed a couple, you know, two or three or four experiments that were designed to test the, for evidence of life in the soil. And, like, almost every astrobiologist today says that it was a null result. It did not find evidence of life. doesn't mean there's no life on Mars, but those that experiment was, con was consistent with no life in the soil, in the, in the regolith. The, the, the designer of the experiment thinks that it was consistent with life. And I, I've seen talks by this guy, uh, you know, not, not too long ago, where they think that the Viking experiment did find evidence of life. And that's actually, you know, as weird as that sounds, that you've got a, such a minority view against the whole community. That's what's great about science. So, yeah, if we find a down saucer with a body in it, everything you said, the, the, some, the, those are all, all possible uh, alternatives will be presented and exhausted by critics, of course. And that's the job of scientists to say, well, they faked their DNA and they did this and they cloned this. and this, yeah. But you have to keep studying it. And if, if what you find is that the, the, those alternatives don't hold up, then, then you're left with this kind of extraordinary conclusion. Um, so, so I think if, you know, again, the data speaks for itself, you just have to keep looking. And then, then the fact that you're going to have scientists being skeptical, trying to break the hypothesis, that's a great thing. That's how science works. Cause you're never going to prove it. You're just going to eliminate all the other possibilities and be left with this kind of unbelievable conclusion. Now, that was the labeled release experiment, and I had the privilege of interviewing the principal scientists on it, Dr. Patricia Ann Stratt. Oh, great. And the designer, the designer was Gil Levin. That's right. Unfortunately, both of them have recently passed away. Oh. Do you think we need? Yeah. I there, didn't know yeah, that. That's, that's sad, yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that we need to redesign an improved label release experiment and drop that thing on Mars before we go there and, <laughs> and expose ourselves to potential surface life on Mars? That must be some amazing life if it's there. Do you think we need to follow that up or do you think it's just we can safely say, no, there's, there's no surface life on Mars? Well, well I, so I, I, don't, I don't think we need to do that exact experiment, but I don't think we can rule out surface life on Mars either. So I think, um, you know, although I, you know, I said astrobiologists were skeptical that that experiment showed that there was life on Mars, uh, the, the criticism is that the experiment was probably premature based on, you know, our limited understanding of Mars. So, you know, the, the existing, the current rovers are on Mars, you know, um, the, the Mars Science Lander, and then, you know, whenever ESA gets ExoMars going, uh, and then other other Mars uh, experiments. 
they are doing things like this, but it's 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 sort of like we took a step back from Viking and said like, okay, we need to understand Mars at a more fundamental level before we start doing just straight up life detection tests like that again, because we just maybe don't understand enough about just the basic, you know, geology and chemistry of, of what's going on there. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think ultimately that might be a reason to send people to Mars. Some of those experiments might be hard to do remotely. Um, but, but like, yeah, eventually it would be great to do more, more life detection experiments, whatever the form would be. And then of course, I guess I'll add to that, um, you know, there could be life on Mars now that's our life, like like we contaminated Mars already. There, there's there's certainly the possibility that with all the spacecraft that have landed or crash landed on Mars, uh, some spores could have been blown to like a moist part of the planet and, and still be there. So, um, yeah, we, we, we don't know if Earth life is on Mars uh, in a viable way. Well, and then there's also the fact that Earth and Mars have been sneezing on each other right. <laughs> with rocks. Yep impacts for for the entire history of the solar system and for all we know maybe a biogenesis occurred on mars and was deposited here and we are actually from mars and we're simply going back to reconquer the home yep, world. Yep, that's, that's <laughs> you <know>? possible yeah <laughs> and that yeah it's just amazing to me um now the the other thing that's hiding within the annals of astrobiology that piqued my interest even though i think it's kind of a stretch the idea of astrovirology where you could have um viruses being transferred through panspermia now people have said that it could be a very dangerous situation where mars might have this generalized virus that that you know evolved to infect any cell it could as mars died and that we be, we could be walking into a trap and <laughs> end up with this this highly generalized virus that that could infect all life on Earth and and cause our extinction. <laughs> Do you think that that would have if that was really possible? And I know viruses are very specific things that usually right. they probably can't do this. But um, but do you think that's something that, that we should verify before we go there? You know, or do you think that if it was a problem, we'd have already been long ago wiped out by this thing through panspermia? I, 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 I'm not convinced by any of the astrovirology claims. I, I think that, yeah, if that were going on in the way that you described or anything like it, we would see... Uh, much more stark evidence that couldn't be explained by our conventional models of virology. Um, but what I'll say is when we send humans to Mars, we do have to be cognizant of planetary protection, which includes protection of the astronauts and then uh, protection of Earth against anything the astronauts bring back. And so if you know the astronauts were to find indigenous life on Mars, um, there should be steps taken, number one, to protect us from contaminating the indigenous life uh, because we want to learn about it. We don't want to destroy it. Um, we should take into account the possibility that something, you know, could, you know, be pathogenic or otherwise harmful to humans. We don't know what it is. We're encountering it. Um, you know, we've all lived through a pandemic now. We understand that there's risks when handling, you know, anything biological. So, so yeah, I'm not worried about like a super infectious virus on Mars, but I think just standard prudence with planetary protection is what you're going to have to do for astronauts who are exploring Mars and might find something. It's interesting. The labeled release experiment, both uh, Gil Levin and uh, Petra Shanstrat both believed to their dying day that they had made a detection. So I, I, I don't know. I, it's interesting to think about. Um, but at the same time, you know, I mean, we don't know what we're going to find and we don't even know if we're looking for the right thing, you know. So if we have some alternate biochemistry going on, which would be very alien, say something based on ammonia or something like that, you know, underneath the crust of Titan or something like that, then we we just <laughs> all bets are off on life in the universe at that point because we don't know all the rules. Do you think that alternate biochemistries are um, going to be <laughs> very viable as far as astrobiology goes? Or do you think everything works the same? Oh, it's all carbon based and it's all water and that sort of thing. Yeah, you know, I, I, my, my opinion is, has shifted a little bit of, uh, on this as, as time has gone on, because I think I used to be a little bit more enthusiastic about alternate biochemistries, and I still think we should study them. Um, I think they might be more prevalent than like weirder worlds. Uh, and then again, like, you know, we don't know. I, I'm not going to say anything strong that, that it wouldn't happen. Maybe there's weird biochemistries happening on Mars. 
Um, but the more we look, the more we really do find water everywhere and carbon everywhere and like all the like organics, you know, ring molecules and other organics in like molecular clouds. Uh, in, in, and, um, you know, there's the alternate biochemistries just kind of seem to get a little bit bigger and more cumbersome and, and like more unwieldy. Uh, so, you know, I don't think we should restrict our imagination, but it just seems like the more we look, the more we, it seems like this water carbon based organic based thing, the ingredients are everywhere at least. And so it seems like an encouraging way. We, we shouldn't, we should certainly, you know, probably prioritize that search just because it seems like, like the, the signs are all pointing in that direction. So your sense so far, abiogenesis, do you think it's straightforward and easy or do you think that it's uh, something that's probably very difficult under very tight conditions or do we simply just not have enough of a picture to say either way? We have no clue. We have to look. We, we, we don't even know if it happened on Mars or not. We don't even know if it happened on Venus or not. Life could have started on Venus before it went runaway greenhouse. So, yeah, we don't even know if it happened multiple times in our solar system or not, let alone other star systems. At least we have a way to figure it out because if we can look at a biogenesis and correct them, the, you know, the chemists are going to look at it and the biochemists and actually figure out what happened. If it turns out that it's easy and straightforward, then we know that this universe teems with at least microbial life. And if it turns out to be hard, we can say, well, oh, this is probably pretty rare. So at least we have a second way above and beyond looking for bio or techno signatures to answer the question within our lifetimes. Do you think that's going to happen? Do you think the chemists are going to crack the nut? I'm skeptical, but I'm rooting for them. You know, I'm friends with people who study that sort of thing. And, and you know, I, I would you know, love to hear, you know, a, a sort of comprehensive theory of, of abiogenesis. But um, I'm skeptical because I... I I just wonder, and this isn't my own idea, these are um, uh, Bob Shapiro, who's passed away a decade or so ago, was a biologist um, who, who studied origin of life. And, you know, he made the point that um, whatever this, you know, it's a series of steps for sure that led to anything that we would call life, even before the cell. It certainly was more than just one step. And that series of steps may have been very critically dependent on many environmental factors happening on the planet at the time. And so even if, you know, a group of chemists can identify seven steps that then lead to something they call proto-life, it may not necessarily tell you a lot about what really happened on a planet and what's required for the environment to create the right conditions for that to occur. And that, that seven steps the chemist comes up with might not even be what happened, just a way to do it. That would still be exciting, of course, because you've shown that there's a way that we can do it. But um, I, th I think it's going to be tricky to even get to that point and then to make the connection to what really happened is, is going to be difficult. Uh, but we should try it because if at the very least, we'll understand where our knowledge comes up against the wall and that'll be useful too. At least we can look into it. And also the UAP, you know, um, maybe there's something to it. And all you need is, a, as was once famously said, one white crow to know that white crows exist. Yeah. So, well, and you know, that's what's you know, fun about being a scientist and what makes, you know, that that's sort of the artistic component of being a scientist is, you know, we have a finite amount of time in our, in our, in our day and in our lifetimes. You have to pick which problems you want to study, which, which things do you think are interesting and which hypotheses do you think are, are worth studying? And you probably have to pick a couple that pay the bills. Um, but then, you know, like if, if you know, some, some people think that studying abiogenesis is worth the risk because we might learn something. I think that's a great risk to take. Um, you know, I think among other things I study, it's, it's worth, you know, putting some time into understanding UAP. Some of my colleagues disagree. Uh, but it, that's my choice. And, you know, some people studied cold fusion and it didn't pan out. But, hey, how would we have known if you hadn't studied it? So you have to th th that's sort of the risk that you take as a scientist, uh, for better or for worse, to decide which problems are worth paying attention to. Worth always keeping in mind that a lot of scientists once were skeptical that the universe could possibly work as general relativity predicted and well, turned out to be real. 
Oh yeah, a lot, lots of examples. Plate tectonics, um, you know, endosymbiosis, um, even the idea that the universe had an age. It was considered to be you know static and, and finite uh, until the cosmic microwave background was discovered. So yeah, science is changing. And, and there's certainly lots of dead ends, but you don't know which ones are going to be dead ends. And then there's there's things that change everything and, and little ideas in the middle. So that, that's what makes it fun. And hopefully it, it we never learn everything and we science never stops progressing. I'll bet that that <laughs> I'll bet there are things in the universe that we will never understand. Oh, you know, for sure. Yeah, there are absolutely away. things that we will we'll never understand. And um yeah, maybe that's that would be the best moment just to get up against that wall to those things that we don't understand and kind of have a moment of humility. And I, I think that's delightful because the, the mystery is preserved no matter what. That's right. All right, Jacob, thanks for joining us. And um, I hope to talk to you again next time uh, you release the paper. Absolutely. Thanks again for having me. Okay, there it is. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.